So welcome. Um, thank you very much for, for coming to today's seminar. My pleasure is to introduce uh, Professor Lynn Bauker, who will be our uh, speaker today. So um, as you already know, probably some of you attended uh, some previous seminars uh, we organized. Um, uh, we started a series of, of um, uh, talks, uh, presentations from uh, uh, very well-established researchers uh, from the area of translation, interpreting, natural language processing. And um, this is um, um, part of our kind of long goal to, to uh, develop uh, research in the area of technology and for translation interpreting. So, so our uh, conference series. And uh, yeah, today's speaker is Professor Lynn Bauker. And uh, I feel always embarrassed when I have to introduce a speaker because uh, yeah, you pick a few things from, from uh, the web, you pick a few things from, from uh, the bio you are sent uh, by the speaker. And uh, it's always, yeah, I'm sure I'm not going to, to do right to, to introduce her because she's so well known um, in the field. And uh, yeah, I'm sure I will leave out something very important. Uh, but yeah, things that I really picked from, from uh, the web and the different bits is um, uh, her background because she has a PhD in language engineering from University of Manchester uh, Institute of Science and Technology. Nowadays, probably this would be called a PhD in natural language processing, which is very interesting uh, uh, given her background um, because she's also a translator, a certified translator um, of French and English. Um, but yeah, her role right now is a full professor at the University of Ottawa in Canada. And interestingly enough, you, you again have the, the combination between translation interpreting and technology because um, she's, uh, she has an appointment with the School of Translation Interpretation and School of Information Studies. So again, we have the, the combination of, of uh, interpreting and uh, uh, translation and technology. And um, yeah, she's been elected uh, uh, in, in the Royal Society of Canada to recognize her contribution to, to the field of translation and interpreting. And yeah, she published lots of articles in, in many areas related to um, uh, translation, interpreting, corpus linguistics. And she also published several books uh, that are, are uh, read a lot by, by researchers in the field of uh, translation interpreting. And um, yeah, I need to say that when I hear her name, um, in addition to, to feel research in, in uh, corpus linguistics, terminology and so on, uh, the things that come to my mind and probably to, to most of the researchers who attend here are the notion of fit for purpose and empty literacy, uh, which are very, very interesting for, for the current developments in the um, translation. So thank you very much for accepting our invitation. It's great, great to see you online and hopefully one day we'll be able to, to meet face to face. Thank you so, so much, Constantine. That was a lovely introduction. I don't oh. think I could have done it better myself. So thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> and yeah, I'm always a, a bit uh, unsure what to say because I would say the floor is yours, but uh, yeah, obviously it's not the floor. So the screen is yours. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Well, I really appreciate the invitation to be here. And um, I have done quite a few different things over the course of my career. But today I'm going to be talking about machine translation literacy, which is the thing that I've been working most actively on recently. And uh, what I'm actually going to do is to share an experience of uh, teaching machine translation to students who are not studying to become translators. So people who are studying other programs, but who um, you know, may have a need to learn to use machine translation. So I'll contextualize that a little bit, but it's not going to be a very technical talk. It's more about from a user perspective and from a teaching uh, perspective today. So I hope that's still of interest to the to the people who have uh, generously come to uh, participate. Okay, I'm going to try and uh, share my screen and get started. And here we go. Okay, and I'm going to turn my video off because this 
puts me like weirdly on top of the slides. So I'll put my video back on a little bit later. But for now, uh, I'll just show you the slides. And I'd like to uh, kind of frame today's talk through the perspective of of machine translation literacy as part of a broader approach to information literacy instruction for, in, for undergraduate students. So as I said, I'm actually going to share a sort of experience that I've had over the past academic year teaching uh, non-translator students. Okay. So why information literacy? Why have I chosen to sort of tie machine translation literacy to information literacy? Well, first of all, information literacy, there are many different specific definitions of it, but I think we can agree that a general understanding of information literacy is this ability to, first of all, identify, then locate, evaluate, and use information effectively. So that is definitely something that students need to do, students in all disciplines. And so it's no surprise that high quality uh, information literacy instruction is something that most universities strive to offer their students, because all students, no matter what they're studying, have to learn how to do some research, how to weigh what they find, and how to apply information. So it's definitely something that students of all disciplines are needing to do and looking to their university to provide them some support in that area. And some of the things that are commonly incorporated into information literacy instruction are things like learning how to search effectively, how to navigate both academic databases and more generally the web, how to distinguish between the different sources that you find, which ones are reputable or high quality, which materials might be more suspicious and maybe things that you shouldn't be relying on, how to cite and reference the sources that you do use. And so all of these things do have an aspect of, of using a tool, like learning how to use a search engine or learning how to search in an academic database, but it goes beyond just this technological knowledge. It's not just about learning how to use the tool, but about learning how to use it critically and evaluating the information that you know, comes out of your search. And information literacy instruction is often, not exclusively, but often delivered in collaboration with a library on campus, for example. And the Association for College and Research Libraries, um, which is here in, in North America, has actually put out a framework for information literacy for higher education. So this group is trying to help university libraries and librarians um, and others who might be interested in information literacy instruction kind of come up with an effective way of helping students become literate in using information. So libraries are, are kind of uh, a pool of expertise in this area. And I was interested to see whether or not information literacy uh, has changed much. The instruction of information literacy has changed much over the past couple of decades. And so I did a little bit of research to see whether or not it seems to be keeping up with the times, right? We've, we've seen a lot of, of changes over the past 30 years, particularly since the introduction of the World Wide Web. And so how has the approach to information literacy instruction changed or evolved? And I found a number of studies and I'm going to mention three in particular, because in, in this case, these three different studies that were conducted in three different countries actually used the same uh, survey instrument. So the results are quite comparable because they all used the same basic instrument to, um, to uh, survey librarians about their information literacy instruction. So the first one, the original one, uh, is... A out of, of, of Canada, and it's actually a longitudinal study. So they have repeated this same survey five times over a 20 year period. And the results show that the situation is relatively stable. In other words, in the past 20 years, there hasn't 
been a dramatic change in the approach to information literacy instruction or the content of instruction. So for the most part, it seems to focus on using databases, developing search strategies, um, more general library use, catalog use. There have been a few modest uh, additions, I would say, to uh, information literacy instruction uh, more recently. There's uh, been an attempt to introduce information about open access, open education resources, uh, a little bit more awareness about predatory publishing. But by and large, it has been pretty stable. And we found similar results in the US and in Israel. These were not longitudinal studies there, but the, the, they were done quite recently and they show a very similar kind of content to what is being taught through information literacy instruction. So overall, we see that a, a main focus on online searching, online catalogs, uh, a few new things coming up like social media or open access, a slight uptake in the integration of new technologies. What's not there, however, uh, is any specific mention of language and how language could be a complicated factor for information literacy. So we in the translation field are quite aware, I think, of how it can be challenging for students to do research in another language. Um, but this is not mentioned at all in any of these um, surveys. And for me, it's interesting because each of those countries, Canada, the US, Israel, all are countries where I think there is a multilingual kind of reality in there. So Canada is an officially bilingual country, for example. The United States has a very high population of Spanish speakers. In Israel, we see Hebrew and, and Yiddish and English. So um, they're all countries where multilingualism exists, but where it doesn't seem to be taken into account in the information literacy instruction. And if there's mention of language, we can also say there's no mention of machine translation as either uh, a tool that could help or as, you know, something that might pose a potential challenge if we do try to use machine translation. So, so these are noticeable absences for me in the information literacy instruction literature. And so then I, I went back uh, to the framework and I thought, well, perhaps the framework itself doesn't seem to allow for language or doesn't seem to account for language. And, and so maybe that's why people are not um, integrating it as part of information literacy instruction. So I went back to the framework and uh, what I found in the framework was that language is mentioned, although it's not um, emphasized, but it is there. And I was actually really interested to see how it was presented because in the framework for information literacy instruction in higher education, scholarship is presented as a conversation. And I thought that was a really nice way of looking at it. They said basically scholarship um, is when communities of scholars, of researchers or professionals come together and engage in a sustained discourse with new insights and discoveries occurring over time as a result of varied perspectives and interpretations. So I really liked that, actually, that idea of scholarship as a conversation. And then they took it a little bit further in the framework um, by noting that learners who are developing their information literacy abilities um, need to recognize that systems privilege authorities and that not having a fluency in the language and process of a discipline disempowers their ability to participate and engage. So if we flip that around to the, to the positive rather than the negative, it's saying that if you want to participate in the conversation, the scholarship as conversation, you need to speak the language. And my reading of this, because it, it's really not that well developed in the framework, but my reading of this is that probably by language, they are referring more to the LSP or the language for specific purposes, the terminology of the discipline. 
But I think it could be broadened to include language more generally in the sense of language like English, French, Spanish. Um, and I think that they're both very relevant. I think that in order to participate in the conversation, you need to speak the language. And the language, both in a general sense of English, French, Spanish, and the language of the discipline, so the, the LSP, the language for specific purposes. So I do think that the framework certainly allows and, and sort of, you know, permits for the inclusion of language as a factor in information literacy instruction. So I was encouraged to see that. And I think it's really important because I feel that the scholarly community uh, grapples with language, not just people like us who are in the profession of translation or the, the field of translation, but the scholarly community at large. And one reason for this is because we have seen in recent decades that English has become more or less entrenched at the moment as the language of higher education and scholarly communication, the principal language where it's used as a lingua franca. And we can see evidence of this in a number of ways. Um, there was a study in 2014, for example, that uh, identified more than 8,000 university level programs that are taught through the medium of English in countries where English is not an official language. So that's a, a lot of non-Anglophones learning through the medium of English. We can also see in countries where English is an official language that there has been, um, in some cases, quite a dramatic increase in the number of international students who are coming. Um, in my own country, Canada, for example, we've seen an increase of, of 175% uh, of international students coming to Canada in the, in the period between 2000 and 2018. And other countries, too, are seeing... Uh, uh, an increase in the number of international students who are coming. We also can see in the scientific literature that in some disciplines, more than 95% of scientific articles are published in English, even where fewer than 5% of the researchers in that field might be Anglophones. So English is definitely a language that students and scholars in recent decades have had to um, learn in order to be able to participate in that scholarship as a conversation. So if that is the situation that we find ourselves in, then can we turn to machine translation? Is there scope for machine translation to help, um, you know, kind of facilitate communication in the scholarly community? So that's one scenario. The flip side of that is that we are seeing, um, while having a lingua franca offers many benefits, it's not a perfect solution. And there are quite a few drawbacks to using a lingua franca, whether it's English or any other language. Just the, the fact that it's a lingua franca uh, can hinder diversity. And, and this in, in a number of different ways. At very pragmatic levels, we see that there is an actual cost to non-Anglophone scholars to participate in the conversation. It could be a cost in terms of time um, for many of us, myself included, doing things in a second or an additional language is more time consuming. So somebody who is uh, having to write in English may take longer, so they may end up with fewer publications than someone who is a native English speaker. So there could be a cost in terms of time. There could be a cost in terms of money. Um, it may be the case that somebody who is writing in English as an additional language might decide to hire um, an editor, somebody to you know, help um, kind of revise their text, or maybe even to translate it in the first place. So there, there could be a like a cost, a literal cost of a financial one. We also are seeing some evidence of language being used as a form of gatekeeping. Um, there have been numerous reports of scholars who have received quite um, pointed feedback about their 
articles submitted maybe for publication that uh, uh, the feedback is very much based around the language issues rather than the scientific content of the article. So language is being used to kind of exclude some voices from the scholarly conversation. We also have had um, uh, kind of uh, research done. Uh, Karen Bennett is one of the researchers who's worked on what she describes as kind of epistemicide, where different languages approach knowledge in a different way, maybe organize knowledge in a different way, kind of think about things in a different way. And when you have to convert that into a, an English, Anglo-Saxon kind of format, it, it actually changes the, the kind of thought process. And so what we end up with is a sort of dominance of, you know, Western or Anglophone ways of thinking and knowing about information. So it's, it's sort of a privileging one way of thinking uh, about the world. There's also been more recently um, evidence that, uh, you know, if we are only privileging Western and English speaking ways of, 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 you know, kind of presenting information, we might also be privileging information that comes out of Western kind of countries. And there's been um, uh, some interesting material from the field of, of ecology recently that shows that, you know, most of the articles about ecology in the academic databases are really only talking about ecosystems that exist in English speaking countries. And, you know, if I think about um, North America or, you know, the UK, they're in a particular climate, in a particular sort of region of the world, and it's not the only region of the world. So, you know, none of those English speaking countries are near the equator, for example. So we're not hearing about ecosystems uh, in those climates. It, it's just a very unbalanced presentation of knowledge. So those are just some of the, the drawbacks of, of using one language as a lingua franca in, in the world of science and education. And so because the drawbacks are becoming apparent, we're starting to see a bit of a pushback against the use of, of in this case, English as a lingua franca and more calls for multilingualism in science. And this is great because it, you know, it will it will resolve some of those problems that I've just talked about, but it also introduces new challenges. If we are going to have multiple languages in our literature, how do we do a multilingual literature review, for example, if we don't speak all of the languages? And very few of us do speak all of the languages. So again, it raises the question for me as to whether machine translation can help. Probably not going to be the ultimate solution, but can it be part of the solution? Can it be something that is, is helpful? So whether we are in a situation where there's a lingua franca and only some people are native speakers of that lingua franca, or whether we're moving towards a more multilingual representation in science and education, there will be some people who need to perhaps use machine translation to help them uh, with the other languages. So either way, I think it's worth asking the question. So we kind of find ourselves between this rock and hard place. If we want everyone to participate in science, we need to perhaps learn how to use technology to help us because we don't all speak every language. So I think it's worth um, looking at the use of MT outside of just the translation community, which is what has received the most attention so far, uh, and for obvious reasons. But now that we've paid a lot of attention to machine translation within the translation community, uh, I would like to see more attention paid to the use of machine translation outside the translation community. And that's what I'm going to focus on now. And so if we want people who are not translators, people who don't have the background that we have, who are not coming with the knowledge that we have, to learn to be effective users of machine translation, perhaps we need to offer them some support. And so this idea uh, that I've been working with for the past couple of years is this idea of machine translation literacy. 
helping people to become smarter and more competent and confident users of machine translation. So for me, machine translation literacy is a kind of combination of digital literacy and information literacy. And it emphasizes critical thinking, not just technical competence. As a tool, machine translation is actually very easy to use. It's, it's just a couple of clicks. So it's not complicated from a user perspective in terms of knowing which buttons to push. What's more complicated is, is knowing whether or not you should be using the tool for the job at hand, right? So it's, it's a little bit more a cognitive than a techno-procedural question. And I should also say that machine translation literacy um, might look different depending on who we're, who we're trying to help. So professional translators certainly do need machine translation literacy, but it's a different type of machine translation literacy than maybe a language student or a student of another discipline or a member of the general public. So it's a customizable concept. It's not just one thing. And today I'm talking about machine translation literacy for a very particular group, but you know, other people may be offering machine translation literacy in a slightly different form to a different audience. Okay, so what is driving the need for machine translation literacy? And I think one of the things that is driving this need is the fact that people outside the translation professions, so non-translators, students of other disciplines, for example, often learn about machine translation through the popular media. So I've put the little Star Trek logo there. We all know about the universal translator and how easy it is to zip around the galaxy and speak to every life form. Um, we, so science fiction is one thing that has kind of, you know, kind of colored the view of machine translation, but also the popular press. Uh, Lucas Nunez Vieira, a scholar at Bristol University, has recently published uh, an analysis of the way that machine translation is represented in the popular press. And uh, one of his main conclusions was that the press tend to report uh, towards the two extremes. Either they're presenting machine translation as something that's almost magical, easy, you know, just poof, there's your solution. Or they're presenting it at the other extreme um, where machine translation is completely useless as a technology. What it produces is a joke, can't be, you know, not valuable in any circumstances. And these two extremes don't really represent the reality. The reality is, of course, somewhere in between, and it requires a more nuanced view. And, and according to the, the research of, uh, of Nunez Vieira, this nuanced view is missing in the popular press, or at least it's, it's quite rare. So that is kind of the way that people outside of translation are introduced to machine translation. So it's not a very realistic or helpful view of the technology. Another reason that we've seen uh, the need for machine translation literacy emerge is because the landscape of machine translation has also evolved quite significantly. Machine translation has been around for almost 70 years or even a little bit more than 70 years now, but the situation has changed a lot during that time. And some of the important changes that, uh, that we've noticed are that, first of all, machine translation is what we might describe as being in the wild, right? Ever since Google Translate put a free online machine translation system available, and that was around 2006, so just 15 years ago, that's quite recent. Um, but since that time, Machine translation has no longer been only in the hands of the professionals, of people who know what to do with it, people who, you know, have a background in translation. Now it's out there. Anyone who has an internet connection can access it. And many, many people are, right? There's a lot of evidence to show that there are millions, billions of people using free online machine translation every day. And you can be sure that most of them are not professional translators. 
Um, I alluded to this already, the fact that as a technology, from a user perspective, machine translation is very easy to use. And in some ways, this works against the technology. When things are really easy, we don't think about them. We go sort of on autopilot, right? And machine translation use is literally copy, paste, click. Or sometimes, like if the widget is embedded in, your, in a tool, like embedded in your browser or embedded in your social media, you don't even have to copy and paste. You literally just click and then voila, you have a translation. And because it's so easy, it's easy to use it in a non-critical way. If we think about uh, the comparison of machine translation technology to something like a uh, translation environment tool, um, from a user perspective, the, the translation environment tool, the translation memory is much more difficult to learn to master, you really have to make an investment to get good at using that tool. With machine translation, it's just easy peasy. And so it's easy not to be thoughtful in the way that you use it. And uh, finally, I'll just point out one third uh, significant change in the landscape of machine translation is that there has been uh, a paradigm shift in the underlying approach to machine translation. We now find ourselves in the age of neural machine translation, which is a data-driven approach that uses artificial intelligence-based techniques like machine learning. And one of the um, very significant reported differences in the machine translation output of neural machine translation tools is that they sound good. They actually sound like a plausible text. And the risk is that they may not be accurately conveying the content of the source text. With the older approaches to machine translation, it was a lot easier to spot mistakes because they these older approaches to machine translation tended to produce the kind of awkward, clunky, I called translationese. And so it was easier to spot the problem areas. Now, because the text sounds very good, you have to work a lot harder to find the errors. And if you are not a professional translator, someone without a translation background, you may just be lulled into this false sense of security that, you know, it sounds reasonable, so it probably is reasonable. And that could lead to problems. So those are, are three, um, you know, there are, are more, but those are three big uh, areas where we've seen a, a change in the machine translation landscape and, and the, some of the reasons why we're seeing this emerging need for machine translation literacy. So where does this leave people who are not trained as translators or not training to become translators? Right? We've got a technology that's easy to access, easy to use, and producing a higher quality of text. Not perfect, but higher than the, you know, the output of, of machine translation systems in the past. So does this mean that they know how to use it wisely, how to optimize it? Uh, and I would say, no, it's not. Why would they? Why would they know how to use it well if they've never been taught, if they don't have a background in translation? So for me, there really is a clear need for machine translation literacy among the non-translation community. And what does this machine translation literacy look like? What kinds of information could be useful to share? We're not trying to train these people to become translators. They don't want to become translators. They're studying something else or, you know, they are working in another field. They don't want to become professional translators, but still they could benefit from some of the knowledge that translators have. So what types of things could we perhaps usefully share with people who are non-translators, but who want to make better use of machine translation. So I do think it's valuable to explain not all of the, what we might say, gory details of neural machine translation and how neural networks work, but at least the general approach of data-driven machine translation. What does it mean to be data-driven? It's corpus-based. What goes into a corpus? How big does your corpus need to be? 
what happens if your corpus is not big enough? What happens if your corpus contains poorly chosen texts? So understanding the data-driven approach can help to signal issues like data sensitivity, why machine translation might not work as well for what we a low resource languages, or why machine translation has sometimes produced biased output. And we've seen a lot of examples um, in, the, in recent years of um, machine translation that is not gender uh, sensitive, that is not uh, handling gender very well. So it's only through understanding a little bit about data-driven approaches that we can sort of be on the alert for potential problems related to data sensitivity. It also helps to explain to students that, and, and really, you know, some of the things that I've learned in, in this experiment have been surprising to me um, in the sense that I, it never occurred to me that somebody wouldn't know that. Some students, genuinely thought that all machine translation systems will produce the same results. So that Google Translate, DeepL, Bing Translator, doesn't matter which one you choose, they all do the same thing and you'll get the same results from all of them. So again, kind of um, socializing the idea of how a data-driven approach works and the fact that these different engines have been trained on different corpora and so will produce different results alerts them to the fact that, you know, if you're not happy with the output you're getting from one machine translation system, you could try another system and you might get different results. And for some of them, it had literally never occurred to them that that different tools um, would produce different results. So that was an eye opener for them and for me. Um, another thing that I think is important to discuss with students is the idea of transparency. So, you know, using machine translation in an academic context can raise issues of academic integrity. Um, so that could mean, you know, if your teacher or professor has asked you not to use it, um, should you use it anyway? Um, if your professor doesn't make any, you know, be a professor of physics or a professor of, of business is, isn't going to comment on whether or not you can use machine translation, but that, that maybe it's worth being transparent about it anyway. So we talk about that sort of ethical side of it um, and particularly academic integrity uh, and the notion that um, if you take a text that has been written by someone else, so maybe you're using machine translation for part of your literature search, um, and then you translate the text into another language, um, you know, just because you've changed the packaging of the ideas doesn't mean that you don't have to acknowledge the source of the ideas. So there's that, that sort of um, uh, plagiarism prevention um, discussion to have as well that students, um, you know, even if you, if you change the language of the, the text that you're citing or referring to, you do still need to cite that as a, as a source. Um, so that's a very particular to the academic context. As I said, machine translation literacy might look different for, for people in different contexts, but when we're dealing with students, that, that kind of discussion around transparency and academic integrity was an important one to have. We also talk quite a lot about risk assessment um, and in, again, in a number of different ways. So risk assessment could be just, uh, you know, partly uh, including the idea that what you put into a machine translation system doesn't go away when you close the window. So it's important maybe not to put private or confidential sensitive information into a free online machine translation system because the terms and conditions of most of those systems allow for the tool developer to keep your data and to potentially reuse it in a number of different ways. So that's one thing that um, is worth kind of uh, a risk assessment, you know, how sensitive is the information that you're putting into the system? In many cases, it's not very sensitive, but you know, you don't want to necessarily put your health or your banking information in there. And we also talk about the different types of translation tasks. And this is, a, again, a conversation that is worth having with people that don't have a translation background. 
it's not that the concepts are difficult to grasp, but it's just that they've never thought about them because they're not translators. So we have uh, kind of, you know, high risk and low risk tasks. So we talk about the difference between, you know, using uh, machine translation to translate an email for a friend versus using machine translation to produce a, a paper to submit to your professor and how, you know, one, uh, the expectations or the tolerance of, uh, of, of language may be different in those different levels. So again, this idea of high risk or low risk tasks or, you know, tasks where we have a better tolerance for a lower level of language and and situations where our you know our tolerance might not be as high and so we need to you know work more to get the text up to a better quality so this idea that there could be different types of translation tasks that, that would require different levels of, of fit for purpose as Constantine mentioned earlier um, again is something that people outside the translation profession don't spend a lot of time thinking about and and why would they until they're in a situation where they need to make that decision so risk assessment is a kind of very important part of of MT literacy for for a, an academic context and then finally we talk a little bit about interacting with MT that it's not just uh, some a, a task, uh, you know, translation is not just a task that we can um, give to a machine translation system and, and then kind of wash our hands of the responsibility. We talk about the fact that uh, it's very surprising for a lot of students that um, you can affect or improve the output of a machine translation system by changing the input. And so we work a lot on translation friendly writing, how we can um, express our ideas in the source text in a way that will improve the output. And this is a particularly interesting for students who want to use machine translation as an academic writing aid. So they are much more capable of manipulating a text in their own dominant language as the input text, and then they'll have less work to do uh, in terms of post-editing the output, which is typically in their less strong language. And of course, we can't forget about post-editing. Even, even if we have done translation-friendly writing, we may still need to be doing touch-up on the output. And so we talk about post-editing. And again, this idea of post-editing to different levels, that you don't need to necessarily agonize over post-editing an email to your friend, but that you should be prepared to invest a little more time in post-editing um, a text that you want to submit uh, as an assignment or something to a, to a professor. So that's just a, a very quick snapshot of some of the highlights of things. And as I said, the concept of machine translation literacy is very customizable. So you, you will probably need to tailor it a little bit to the needs of your audience. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is tell you about my actual experience where I was um, teaching machine translation literacy uh, over the past, uh, well, I'm gonna talk about two experiences. I'm going to first of all talk about an experience where I tried to work with the university libraries. And this was my first instinct. As I mentioned at the beginning, information literacy instruction is often tied to the librarians. They are very knowledgeable. I have a lot of expertise in information literacy instruction. And so I wanted to see if machine translation literacy could be integrated into some kind of library programming. My idea was that, you know, the library cuts across the whole campus, across all disciplines, and, you know, so students from every program will be coming to the library, and the library does offer quite a robust set of programs, workshops, different types of offerings, including an in information literacy instruction. So um, just before COVID, and um, like enough said, right, just before COVID, I managed to actually do work in libraries with librarians. And I uh, ran two workshops, one at my own university, the University of Ottawa, and one at Concordia University, which is um, just uh, down the road in Montreal. And I offered the workshops um, uh, in a sort of open way. So it wasn't aimed at any Particular group. I mean, the, the groups were, were university students. So what I got was a mixture of, of undergraduate and graduate students, although primarily undergrad, 
I got a mixture of students from kind of the sciences and the humanities, and I got mostly uh, non-native English speakers. In fact, I had no English speakers at all coming to these uh, library workshops. Um, and the, the students had a range of uh, different uh, dominant native languages. So I ran one workshop at each university in the fall of 2019. And it was a fairly short workshop. So it was just an hour and a half. It was really like a whirlwind tour. There's really only so much that you can cover in an hour and a half. It did not have a lot of practical exercises in terms of, you know, working on pre-editing or post-editing. We, we just didn't have time. I kind of gave them some materials, things they could work on themselves later. But it was very, very brief, and it was very sort of lectury, not really that interactive. Um, but I did ask them to fill out a very short survey at the end of the workshop, and the results were encouraging enough. Um, the majority of participants uh, felt that they learned something new. So, you know, it hadn't been a waste of time. They weren't coming just to learn things they already knew. They had learned new things at the workshop. Uh, they felt that it had, you know, given them a little bit of a confidence boost. They'd picked up a couple of tips or tricks for things that they would try would hopefully make them go better. Um, they were not as confident that they would be able to do translation-friendly writing because, as I said, we really didn't have a lot of time to focus on that. That was more material that I gave them to take away. Um, and they, most of them did say they would plan to use machine translation uh, perhaps even a bit more than they already did. Um, and again, the majority said they would recommend the workshop to appear. And some of them even said that if, if we offered a more advanced workshop, they would come back to learn more. So it was encouraging enough, I think. And as I said, this was in October, November, 2019, and then COVID. So this kind of um, became not my focus anymore. <laughs> like everyone else, I think I was scrambling to pivot my courses to online and not really thinking about continuing this um, at that time. But what happened um, um, almost uh, a year later was that I had the opportunity to think about new ways of sharing this information. Some of the challenges that I found with the library workshops were, firstly, it was a ton of work to promote them and recruit them. Um, you know, leading up to even the week before the workshop, very few students had registered and I really had to do a tremendous amount of, of really advertising and, and promoting and contacting people to try and get people to come. So although I had a reasonable turnout in the end, it was a lot of work. Um, also, the workshops at the library are, are optional, clearly, and people don't know what they don't know. And so they might not realize the value of the workshop. When, when you're talking about information literacy instruction, you tend to feel that it's, it's sort of something that should be almost obligatory for students. Um, and so if I want machine translation to be part of that obligatory offer, maybe offering it through an optional workshop is not the best way to reach people. As I said, it was also very short. There was, you know, no homework, no time for reflection. It was really, um, it was a, like a mini lecture rather than a, a full on workshop. And library programs, they don't like to repeat the same workshop every week. You know, they have a variety of offerings. So at most they would probably offer this once or twice a year and it would take a long time to reach a critical mass of people. So I started to reorient my thinking away, not because the library is a bad place to do it, but maybe it's not the only place to do it. So I started to think about how could we build this potentially into a required university course. And at my university in Ottawa, all of the uh, students who are registered in the Faculty of Arts, taking any program through arts, have to take uh, at least one English course, one philosophy course, and one what is described as an interdisciplinary course. And the goal of all three of these is to really help students develop their critical thinking uh, and writing skills. So skills that will set them up to succeed in their programs during the rest of their studies and hopefully beyond. 
So this um, interdisciplinary course, uh, it's got a very general description. And the idea is basically that students, or sorry, professors from at least two different departments co-teach a course. It can be two professors or three professors from different departments co-teach a course. And they kind of choose a theme and then they look at it from the perspective of their discipline. So it changes every year. And essentially what happens is that um, the university puts out a call every year for professors to pitch a, a theme for a course. So I got together with a professor from the information science department. I'm with my translation hat on and, and this other professor from information science. And we pitched a course that we called new literacies for the digital age. And we piloted that course just this past uh, winter semester, so from January to April 2021. And machine translation literacy then was built into this required course called New Literacies for the Digital Age. Uh, obviously, the whole course was not about machine translation literacy. Machine translation literacy was one module in the course, so roughly three class uh, contact hours plus some homework and other activities um, surrounding it. And the course covered much more than machine translation literacy, but it was part of this uh, required course. So that's what I'm going to share with you now. Uh, there were 80 students registered for the course in total, and it ran from January to April of uh, 2021. So the profile of the 80 students who registered for the course, as I said, it's for students in any program in the Faculty of Arts. We got uh, a high number of students from the communication um, program, which is one of our biggest programs, uh, but also students from other programs, like visual arts, linguistics. Environmental studies looks a bit odd here, but in, um, in, at the University of Ottawa, the Department of Geography is part of the Faculty of Arts for historical reasons, and environmental studies is taught through the geography department. So that one is looks perhaps a bit odd compared to the others, but so these are all students from different programs in the Faculty of Arts. And I, I surveyed the students and asked them uh, what was their native language. And most of the students were Anglophones, just over half of them. But we had a very high number of students who were not Anglophones in this course, um, possibly owing to the fact that because of COVID, we did have a fully online offering. And so we had a higher than typical uh, percentage of international students. So this may be a little bit of an anomaly for that year, but we had so roughly, we'll say just over 50% Anglophones and um, the other students coming uh, with other languages. Of course, it's not surprising to see a high number of French uh, Francophone students because we are a bilingual university in a bilingual city. So we, often do get francophones who are very competent in English and, and will take uh, courses in English. So that, that's not surprising, but some of the others, particularly the, the number of Chinese students is a bit higher than I would have typically expected to see. Okay, at the end of the workshop, so I've already shared with you the basics, the basic kind of content of what we um, covered in, in the information literacy, uh, machine translation literacy module in the information literacy course. Um, I asked them to do a short survey and we had uh, responses from 67 of the 80 students. It was a voluntary survey, so not all of them did it, but 67 was a pretty good number. And what I would like to share with you now are the questions that I asked them and the responses that they gave. So keeping in mind that these are not translators, I said, how often do you use machine translation? And we got a range of responses, but we can see that, you know, 85% of the students use it at least once a month, and many of them using it much more often than that. So, you know, once a week, three or four times a week, every day, we are seeing that non-translators definitely use machine translation. Next question I asked them was, what kinds of activities do you use it for? And I gave them a choice of their courses, their studies, um, maybe they have employment or, or leisure activities. And we see that all three generated some response, um, the job the least of all, but definitely quite heavy use in both the courses and the leisure activities. 
I asked them sort of what was their goal or purpose in using machine translation? Was it because they needed to read something or understand something in another language? Because they wanted to write something in another language or a combination of the two? And we see that most of the students said that they're using machine translation for both purposes, both reading, understanding, and writing or producing a text in another language. So in both of those uh, sort of directions. I asked them, what would they do if there was no free online machine translation? What would they do instead? They clearly have translation needs. And if free online machine translation wasn't an option for them, what would they do? And this was really interesting. Now, we do have to keep in mind that they're students, so they probably don't have a big budget, but nobody would pay a professional translator. So this market or this group of users of machine translation, um, in this case, it's not a competition with professional translators. There's nobody here who would pay a professional translator to meet their translation needs. So machine translation is not taking away business from anybody among this group of users. Um, instead, what they said they would do would be to ask a friend or colleague to help, or maybe just do nothing. And, and you know, we saw that some of the machine translation was being used for leisure purposes, so maybe it's not that critical. Quite a few of them just said they just wouldn't bother, and most of them said they'd ask a friend. I asked them of all the different things that you learned, what we talked about, which element was the most surprising to you? What did you learn about machine translation that was unexpected or that you hadn't thought about before? And I got a range of answers, which pleased me because it meant that, that they were learning new things, right? That there were new and, and sort of information that they didn't have before and that they found valuable and interesting. Um, the most common element that was surprising for them was something they just hadn't thought about before, this idea of, of the material that you enter into the machine translation system online uh, being kept and you know, not being private, uh, that it didn't just disappear. So that was the, the sort of the most surprising thing. Um, the potential for algorithmic bias was something that students found very interesting. They hadn't ever reflected on that, was not something that had occurred to them. The idea that there are different tools and that the tools will produce different results, as I mentioned, something that seems so obvious to practicing translators, but was not something that the non-translating students had thought about. Uh, the idea of improving the output by improving the input, this idea of translation-friendly writing. Um, so, you know, overall, they, the different students found different things to be surprising and, and new novel information for them. And so that made me think that, that there was some value in it. They were learning new things. Um, and just two more questions. I said the, the idea of machine translation literacy, how important do you think that is for non-translation students? You are students who are not planning to become professional translators. You have other plans. You're studying other things. Do you think that machine translation literacy is important? And again, I was really pleased by the results that most of them felt it was at least moderately important. The majority said very important, and a few even said essential. Um, nobody felt that it was not valuable. Nobody felt that their time had been wasted by learning about machine translation literacy. And the last question I said, do you think that we at the University of Ottawa should be teaching all students about machine translation literacy? And again, I was quite pleased by the, the reaction to the students. A few said probably not. Um, you know, it's really not of primary interest to students who aren't being translators. Um, and, and, you know, a reasonable number said maybe um, that we learned some stuff, maybe it's worthwhile, but the majority said probably and, and even definitely that there was value in teaching machine translation literacy to non-translation students. So that was something that I found very encouraging. Again, we're talking about 67 students. It's not, not tens of thousands of students. So I'm, I'm, you know, trying not to be naive, but at the same time, I, I was encouraged by the results. 
So I've been talking for a long time now. I'm going to wrap up my um, basic takeaways from this experiment. Um, and these are takeaways that for the translation community, which you know, I consider myself part of, and probably most of you do too. Um, machine translation is not going away, and non-translators use it. Even if we think they shouldn't, even if we think, oh, I really wish that you just wouldn't put that text in the translation system, they will, they do. And so we can't have our head in the sand about, uh, you know, like an ostrich about the fact that, that um, you know, maybe they'll just stop using machine translation. They won't stop. They're using it and they're going to keep using it. And they use it quite often and in multiple contexts. So for their leisure activities, for their studies, and even for professional purposes, um, not for professional translation purposes, but in other professions. And they use it for text production as well as text comprehension. So they're doing all kinds of things with machine translation. And in this case, non-translators, or more specifically in this case, students, either can't or, or won't pay for professional translation for their translation needs. So we don't need to feel threatened like they're taking business away from us. They wouldn't be giving us that business anyway. They, they are not willing to pay for it uh, for, their, for their needs, for the students. Non-translators, in, in, at least in this case, found machine translation literacy to be useful, valuable, not a waste of their time. And this was the, uh, I said, like, I keep emphasizing it, but it really is important. Things that are obvious to translators are not obvious to non-translators. You know, why should they be? Um, but they're not. So it's worth telling people things that seem obvious to us because they are not obvious to other people. And my takeaway from this is that machine translation literacy can be a good fit within a broader program of information literacy at universities. And I was dealing with first year students here. So these students probably didn't start using machine translation only once they hit university. I suspect they started using it sooner. So perhaps there's even scope for, you know, kind of introducing machine translation literacy to students who are at high school or, or younger. Whew. Okay, and I'm going to stop there because I feel like I'm perhaps a little bit over my time. Thank you very much. Uh, this has been very Oops, interesting and sorry. fascinating <laughs> talk. Um, yes, I'm, I'm sure, yeah, you're, you're not over time. It's, uh, yeah, we have enough time for, for discussion and, and uh, Question. So, um, any questions? Any comments about the talk? I can't see everybody. Please raise your hand or turn on your, your camera and, and, and the microphone if you want to ask a question. If not, uh, oh, go. Yeah, Anna, please. <laughs> I'm sure there are a lot of very experienced translators and scholars who want to ask a question, but probably I will start. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lynn. That's very inspiring and also very pleasant because I enjoy every minute of your talking. That's really very, very fantastic um, talk. Um, uh, it's, I myself definitely think that it's necessary for the students to have such a course, training them how to use uh, these skills, very basic skills, that's definitely useful. Uh, but if I, I want to extend the application of machine translation, just now you mentioned in your slides that we can use it in, in multiple contexts. Mm -hmm. Probably nowadays, uh, we can see that so many things are happening, the pandemic, everything. So, for example, in risk communication or uh, the application of, uh, uh, of the machine translation in healthcare settings. So maybe that is also now um, catching a lot of attention. So would you please talk a little bit about your understanding of this question? <laughs> I agree with you. Um, I think um, machine translation is being used in crisis communication contexts, in healthcare communication contexts, and that risk assessment is clearly uh, a priority if you were talking about machine translation literacy in those contexts. 
I, I don't want to put myself forward as an expert in that area because I, I don't have a lot of personal experience, but I will um, mention work that's being done um, by some scholars at Dublin City University who may be familiar to you already. So uh, Patrick Cadwell and Sharon O'Brien have done um, some work and Wina Tessur as well, who is a postdoctoral researcher um, and who works with a lot of non-governmental organizations. She organized a few weeks ago, maybe a month or so ago, um, a, a talk where Patrick and Sharon did some machine translation literacy training for people who work for those NGOs. And, uh, and it was really interesting and a little bit different than the type of MT literacy that I've presented today because it was a different audience. But I think it shows that um, there is value in customizing it and, and uh, that was definitely a group the you know I, I was there just as an observer not as a one of the members, but I could see uh, you know the the enthusiasm the, the good reception that it got so I agree with you that that is another community where there's definitely a need I mean COVID has um, you know had a, a lot of downsides to it but one silver line that we might take away is the fact that it's really raised awareness about the importance of multilingual communication, the need for it, the, the kind of value. We don't necessarily have all the solutions yet, but I think it's really shone a spotlight on the need for multilingual communication and how we can't leave communities behind uh, in a global health crisis. Thank you very much for your comments. Thank you, Lee. Thank you. Uh, can I ask you to turn on the cameras if, if you can, please? I think it's, it's, uh, it's better if we see some faces, it's a bit uh, impersonal, uh, yeah, kind of. <laughs> so um, anyone else uh, brave enough to ask a question? <laughs> if not, I have a question. It's a kind of uh, not exactly linked to, to what you talked about, but I was wondering, um, what do you think companies, producers of, of uh, machine translation, and especially Google, because it's used so much, could do um, in the direction of making users aware of um, the limitations? Um, um, is there something they can do beyond some disclaimers uh, to say, be careful when you use this? Yeah, I mean, they are in a, a sort of... Um in a difficult situation, I guess. I mean, they're making a, a technology available for free, which is fantastic. Um, but they also you know, free in this in the monetary sense, <laughs> maybe not free uh, completely, because I feel like we pay for it in other ways, right? We pay for it by allowing them to use our data. And I one of the things that students said was, um, you know, when they really thought about it, it wasn't surprising. They're like, oh, I did a double take when you said that they can keep my data. But then upon reflection, like, yes, of course, they're keeping my data. Like, what was I thinking? Um, but I think what they would like is more transparency. So it's there in the terms and conditions, but the terms and conditions are buried deep down in the website, several layers, um, maybe in a fairly legal kind of language that is not necessarily easy to parse. So I think um, maybe they could do a, a little bit better of a job um, at being transparent themselves about what's happening with their tool. And, you know, um, I know they been responsive. I uh, mentioned the issue of Google Translate in particular not um, handling gender necessarily very well in translation, uh, particularly when translating between languages that are marked for gender and or rather between languages that are not marked for gender into a language that is marked for gender. Um, the, the, the tool has to make a choice. So um, I'm, I'm not a speaker of Turkish, but I've been told that Turkish has a kind of gender neutral third person pronoun. And that when we translate from Turkish into a language like English or French, uh, we have to choose between he and she, and um, that, that Google doesn't always do a good job. It, it tends to show bias. Um, there was some evidence that it was assigning male pronouns in the context of certain jobs like doctor and female pronouns in the context of other jobs like nurse. Um, and so Google has responded and, you know, kind of tried to, um, well, certainly they're working on addressing the problem, but yeah, maybe be more public about it sort of, you know, um, it, rather than 
than just saying, okay, we're going to take the information away and we're going to go back to our labs and we're going to work on it. That's great. But, but tell people that you're working on it. Kind of be upfront about the problems that are out there, the challenges, the uh, attempts that you're making to fix it. Uh, I feel like they just sort of put the tool out there and there's the, the actual Google Translate page itself is, is very blank, right? There's just like a, enter your source text, enter your target text. And there's not like a kind of, it, it's not like a portal of information about machine translation. And it be, there could be more. Another group that could do so much better is us. Uh, and I'm not talking so much about the professors, I'm talking about practitioners. Uh, I have been horrified, ashamed to see um, messages on the websites of professional translators associations, including the one that I belong to, uh, which basically say machine translation is terrible don't ever use it, hire me instead, and all your problems will be solved. Well, of course, a professional translator will do a great job, but this is a student who's translating, um, you know, an anime movie for their leisure, really, is the solution that they have to go in for a professional translator. So I think translators associations, too, could do a much better job of this nuanced messaging that uh, Lucas Nunez Vieira said was missing from the popular press is also missing from the professional associations. So, you know, American Translators Association, Translators Association of uh, Ontario, which is the one I belong to, but quite a few others. The messaging on their websites is terrible. It, it really says machine translation is garbage. Don't ever use it. Uh, and it's actually fear mongering as well. It's, it's sort of saying, if you dare to use machine translation, you'll regret it. Like it will, you know, cost your business so much money and so many. It's not a helpful message. People are using it. And I feel like we have a social responsibility to help use it better. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, mm -hmm. I see I, we have a question for Hadil. Yes. Uh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Thank you very much for the presentation. It's very interesting. I have two points uh, about the presentation that were uh, very interesting. The first one is about the risk assessment. Uh, from experience, from working on natural language processing and machine translation, there are sometimes critical translation errors, which students, especially non-native speakers of English, would not realize. And uh, this is something that needs to be uh, highlighted in uh, the um, machine uh, translation literacy, the one that you talked about, because there are really critical translation errors that could really give problems to the students. And I remember that I was teaching um, to non-native speakers, uh, English to non-native speaker students. They were university students, and they were supposed to do an essay. Uh, so what they did is that they wrote it in Arabic, and then they just uh, handed it to Google Translate, and they yeah. handed it back to me. So, of course, there are um, sometimes there are mistakes that I, I understood, of course, it's, it's Google Translate, uh, although, as you mentioned, the NMT now is, uh, is very hard to, uh, to pinpoint that this is actually machine translation. It's less <laughs> obvious, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But then the critical errors, especially if a negation marker is missed, uh, if a sentiment word is flipped to the opposite, so this is something that needs to be highlighted as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, as an educator, this is something that I'm grappling with now, uh, not so much with the non-translators, the one that I talked about today, but of course I also do teach translators, right? I'm involved in translator training. And yeah, I am grappling, as are my colleagues, with kind of when to introduce these tools. Do we sort of recommend students start using them right from the first year of the program? Would we prefer that maybe they get a little bit of translation experience under their belt before they start using the tools? Um, it's, it's a difficult question. It's a completely different reality to the one that I learned to translate in, right? And so, um, yeah, it's a struggle. We're, we're trying to develop uh, sort of policies. So there are some classes where we really would prefer them not to use machine translation, uh, but certainly by the time they graduate, we want them to be comfortable with machine translation because it is a, a tool that they can put in their toolbox. Um, so it's a struggle at the moment, I don't have an answer about where in the program to introduce it. 
um, or even w- in which types of courses, like should it be used? Obviously we do talk about it in a translation technology course, but is it better placed in a practical translation course now? And so we're grappling with all of these things. It's such a, a rapidly evolving situation right now. Uh, but I am definitely, uh, one of the things that I definitely encourage is transparency. If you use the tool, tell me that you've used the tool. And, you know, don't try to hide it. Don't try to pretend that you didn't. I'm not telling you that it's bad to use the tool, but I'm saying, you know, be honest about using the tool. And and so that's one thing that I'm... Yeah, especially yeah. if there's a critical error, as I said, um, yeah. it shouldn't be referred back to the student yeah. or whoever is using yeah. it, yeah. 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 And this idea also of really emphasizing responsibility on the translator part, it, whatever tool you use, at the end of the day, you are responsible for the target text. You need to stand over the target text. So you should be sure that the target text is one that you are willing to stand over. <laughs> and, you know, um, so the, so this idea of responsibility and that you're not, you know, you can use a tool, sure, but you're not um, absolving yourself of the need to be responsible for the, t- the, the target text at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, thank you. I see we have a question from Megan, or at least she raised her hand. Do we do. Hello. I'm not sure if you can hear me because as you can probably see, I'm outside. So apologies for that. Um, I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear you though. Yes. <laughs> Good, lovely. First of all, thank you so much for this talk. I mean, obviously, I'm just, just a master's student, so I'm a little bit starstruck. We've been studying your work for quite a while. So thank you very much for that. Um, but also, um, I'm coming at this from the experience of being a secondary school teacher over in France. And so I, I 100% agree with what you say about uh, school age students needing this, well, this, this education into, into um, machine translation literacy. Um, my question was, well, kind of twofold. I mean, first of all, is this something that you have, for example, approached local schools about already? And also, secondly, perhaps one could argue that um, younger teenagers, for example, need a little bit more of an interactive aspect to, you know, keep them engaged, we all know. Um, yes. Is that something that you have already started thinking about? Are there elements you are willing to make more, more interactive? And if so, um, yeah, how? <laughs> yeah, I, I, thank you. That's a great uh, series of questions. Um, I do think there is definitely scope for working with schools. I haven't yet worked with schools, um, partly because there are in, in Canada, I imagine in other places too, um, quite a few ethical hurdles to get through. Like I would need to get a criminal background check to go into a school. I, I you know, it's a sort of, so for practical reasons, I haven't done it yet, although it's on my list of things to do. What I have done is I've started working with the University of Ottawa's outreach team. And we have uh, the engineering outreach program. They offer workshops, summer camps, um, you know, March break, sort of spring break camps. They have um, uh, family events. They they do all kinds of, of things. Um, they offer mini courses where um, high school students come to the university uh, for one week of enrichment courses. So the, so the outreach team is actually the group that I've started working with rather than going directly to the school. So, so they are absolving me of the need to do a lot of the legwork because they already have contacts. So part of it is a little bit laziness. I will um, just kind of leverage the resource that's there for me already at the university through this outreach team, get to them that way. But it's not class learn as you said so so I'm not so they don't actually go into the schools and teach you know they have it's more like the summer camp the kind of family fun day sort of sort of thing I definitely think there's scope to have it in schools as well and that's where uh, potentially school librarians for schools that have school librarians that could be a good resource as uh, because as I said the librarians actually have a lot of background in this Um, And then if we want it to be teachers, then what we really need to do, and this is where my more immediate uh, kind of attention is going, it's train the trainers. So it doesn't make a lot of sense for me to go into schools because I can only go into so many schools. What we, we really need to do is get a program up and running. So I'm going to be working, like, say, with the faculty of education who are training 
teachers. And that's, I think, a, a better kind of place um, to be more influential and reach more people. So if we could get this into an education kind of faculty where the, those people are training teachers to say, hey, as part of your information literacy instruction, think about doing this. So I don't know, maybe you have more ideas because that seems to like a world that you've come from. Um, maybe you have ideas about how to reach them, but I really see it being more logical to train the trainers rather than to have translators going into schools personally. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with you. I mean, the idea of training the trainers really gets the message out there a lot widely, more widely yeah. and more, more effectively. Um, as you were saying this, my mind was going, hmm, how can we bring this to France? Because um, <laughs> that's always where my mind goes. Um, I will have a think. I will genuinely have a think because it's, it's honestly a topic that I find very fascinating, particularly because, um, bringing it back to my experiences again, um, I'm a language teacher out there. And so obviously you see young young students immediately going to Google Translate, you know they do it, you will constantly then have to reprimand them on it and you don't want to have to because they are trying, yeah, you understand the, the, yeah. the issues there. Which is cycle, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But um, I will, I'll, I'll have a think, definitely. Excellent, <laughs> excellent, yeah, because I don't know if like you, I don't know if you just went to France on your own initiative or if you're part of a program of, of, um, of English, teachers who go to France I don't know but but maybe like through some kind of association I know there's um for example I've heard of the Japanese uh English teachers the JET program where um Anglophones would go to Japan and teach English there so like maybe those types of associations too mm. could, could help yeah. yeah completely I mean in in this context I'm actually uh I passed the concours so I'm a member of the Education Nationale over there um, okay. So obviously we know there are more administrative hoops than uh, <clears throat> other <laughs> other ways, but um, no, I'll, I'll definitely have a think. Yeah, and I do think that we're going to see that machine translation literacy is going to be different when we're dealing with teaching language than teaching a different subject through another language. Because a physics teacher, for example, doesn't really care if the student uses machine translation. They just want to know that you get the physics concepts, and if your essay that you and then demonstrates that you get the physics concepts, they don't really care what tool you used. Whereas a language teacher, this is where it's, it's sort of this transparency issue and, and, and kind of, um, you know, having more of a conversation, depending on the, on the learning objectives of the course, translation, machine translation may or may not be desirable, right? So there may be some learning objectives in a language learning course where you really don't want them to use machine translation, or at least not right away. Um, and that might be different than, like I said, a physics course or a geography course where the goal is not language learning. The goal is demonstrating that you get the those subject concepts so we that's where it's a kind of customizable thing we have to th be prepared to be flexible at, at, about you know kind of the type of empty literacy needed by different groups students you know like it's convenient to talk about students as one group but students are really like many 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 groups yeah mm -hmm. I thank you so much for those questions and i will also be reflecting further because i do think it's the next <laughs> sort of market, if I could describe it like that, that, that we need to try and reach, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I believe Sabina has a follow-up uh, comment on this, and then we have Claire who, who raised her hand. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. So as the co-host, I can't raise my hand electronically. So um, <laughs> first of all, um, well, Lynn, as you know, I had to be late and apologies again um, I answered to everybody. So I, I unfortunately had something that I could not move away. So I'm, I'm, I have to contend with the recording later, but I'm pleased to be able to catch some of the question and answer this really interesting. You know that I, I'm really interested in this topic I'm about sort of, yeah, mainstreaming these critical poems about um, MT to, to a wider public, to educate the public really. I think this is so important to the pupils. In connection to what we were just discussing now, I think I personally believe that even a physics, um, environment, they need to be aware of it. Um, I, I've often thought um, when it comes to languages and translation that still school education is way behind. You know, what, what do people learn even about any kind of translation in school? 
if I'm not mistaken, that hasn't changed much since perhaps when I went to school. Um, of course, we, we learn about languages or we learn languages or some of us, some people learn languages still in school. Yeah? But why not language technology? Why not um, yeah. communication technology? You know, I mean, we learn about chemistry in school. I have forgotten my chemistry knowledge, I admit. <laughs> that is perhaps a bad thing. But um, yeah, um, we never... Uh, we never even learn about things like language or communication technology, even though that is something that in one way or another, it does concern us all. And, you know, this is why I think it is still, there's still such low awareness about many people not even realizing that maybe when they read a subtitle, they actually read something that has been translated or yeah. when they listen to a human interpreter they don't even who is remote they don't even realize that this is a human interpreter i've been asked those questions oh this is a human interpreter really you know, so so there, <laughs> there, i think there is a really good case to be made for you know what you are saying here this this sort of spreading this into education also really to spread this whole idea about it and and then i think it also of course um concerns us as translation trainers, as you were saying earlier, I think the <laughs> rest is short, we are also grappling with that, <laughs> how to, and all the questions you have raised, I thought, oh God, have you been listening into our conversations here in our center? <laughs> of course, all the same questions, right? Um, I also think, yes, I totally agree about the transparency everywhere. If it's our own students tell us when you used it, but I think the onus is also on us to create this atmosphere, this environment, where it is clear to students that they can be honest about it. That's not about punishing somebody for this. I mean, I think 10 years ago or whenever this started, we, we were wondering, should we really allow this? Now, but we are way beyond this. And I think for us as people who teach translation and interpreting, we need to create an environment where it is possible to discuss those, which I think also comes with setting some rules where we don't use it and where we explain to you students, and I see quite a few of our students here, why in some cases, in some classes, we don't want you to use it. It's, I think, for your own good, actually, yeah? and that there is a purpose behind that. So, so yes, that was just I, my I, I agree so much. I mean, I really think there's very little to be gained by saying no, don't, um, because they clearly are anyway, but then we make it, they make, we make them feel like they need to be ashamed of it or that they need to be secretive about it. So, um, uh, yeah, I don't, I really, I don't like being a, a, a cop, you know, like the police, the MT police <laughs> and telling people, no, no, no. I really think it's better to help them understand, he, yes, this context totally makes sense. Why wouldn't you use machine translation? It'd be silly not to use machine translation. This context, hmm, slow down, think about it. What are the benefits? What are the drawbacks? Do the benefits outweigh the drawbacks? Can you mitigate the drawbacks? Like it, it's really, it is this, it, for me, machine translation use isn't about what button do I push? It's, it's that whole reflective piece, right? Should I be using it? what are the risks of using it? You know, what risks can I mitigate? Um, you know, how do I need to frame it? Like exactly being transparent and telling people like this is a machine translation or it, it's post edited machine translation or whatever. And, and I, I totally agree with you. We need to change the atmosphere so that it's not shameful or wrong, but that it's part of our, of our professional responsibility to reflect on it and to and 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 also to take responsibility for the resulting product and how we get that product you know like different people may use different approaches and machine translation is one option but you need to be prepared to do the work that comes with machine translation it's not the easy out that people might think uh that that it could be mm -hmm. well we also maybe just to add that i i agree and um, we also um are quite um, happy or glad in a way that's so fortunate, that's the word here. Um, um, we have an association of uh, translation and interpreting programs uh, for the UK and for Ireland, the APTIS, and I see I'm saying it because I see colleagues here, I see David, you are here. Um, hello. <laughs> and um, where I think, you know, these topics, so this is really also an association um, to discuss training issues. And so we have actually, we are quite fortunate in having this formalized. And I know there are similar associations in other countries, including Canada, and um, 
where, where we, I know we have discussed these things and, and um, colleagues have done also now obviously webinars and online seminars. So, so where we as teachers are all talking about it and that's, that's really good, which is why I'm pleased to also see some colleagues from other universities here and um, really nice. Okay, thank you. Well, the conversation has gone beyond people who specialize in translation technology now, right? Like, you know, I've been talking about machine translation for 30 years, but it can't just be me now talking to the translation technology person at Surrey. It's like, we are all the translation technology people now. Some of us may still be, you know, more, it's like, it's not all to the same depth, but there's no translation professor who can afford not to think about technology now. Whereas 30 years ago, Translation technology was like an independent course that was separate from, you know, the actual translation practice courses and, and it's like um, kind of in a vacuum. And now we we can't treat technology like that anymore. It, it's it cuts across the whole program and all the professors to be part of the conversation, it's not all to the same degree, but but certainly to some degree. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Um- I believe we have uh, one question from Claire and probably this will be the last one because uh, we, we overrun the time. Okay. Right. Hi. Um, thank you, Lynn. I, I just want to say that I, I really like your fresh approach of um, really looking at uh, machine translation really from people outside translation studies. And, and I think we as uh, scholars, translation study scholar, including myself, we, we, we tend to go inwards and thinking, you know, what you know um what other part of the discipline other disciplines uh what they do and then trying to bring that to to the, mm. the discussion in translation so you're doing the other way around i think that, that shows the maturity of us or, or discipline anyway because let's let's be honest i think translation studies are relatively young discipline uh, in the academic world um and I, I just want to add to the uh, discussion previously uh megan and you had about this um, language teaching in terms of machine translation. I, I happens to come across, you know, articles that in a second language acquisition, actually the use of NT, especially so Google Translate Neuro Machine Translation <clears throat> um, as a way to teach um, mm-hmm. foreign languages in, in schools um, or in even uh, colleges and universities. This is a, a topic um, under research. Um, at least the, the, the one I read, it, it did says that it seems to be more helpful for novice language learners. Okay. So I think that's, that's, that's just to contribute that, that there's areas of research in that. So, yeah. yeah, I've seen, uh, again, I, because I'm not a language teacher per se, and because there's so much literature on everything now, I'm not up to speed completely on the literature of machine translation used for language teaching, but I do know that um, there has been some interesting work done in Hong Kong, um, and including school age children, not only university level children. Um, and I, I'm, I believe the name is uh, Stapleton. Uh, I'd have to look it up, but I think uh, there has been some interesting work that has come out of um, out of Hong Kong uh, at all at all three levels, like primary, secondary, and uh, higher education. So definitely. Um, that's another, you know, very bilingual area uh, of the world, a very bilingual region. So they are, um, you know, quite, kind of quite uh, you know, dealing with it on a daily basis, I would say. So that could be one place to look. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I agree with you that it's uh, probably a hot topic of conversation among language teachers as well as, a, as just like we're having the conversation here in our translation community. I suspect that language teachers are also... Uh, having this conversation. Yeah. Thank, you. Uh, thank you very much. I, I really hate uh, killing a discussion when it goes so well, <laughs> but uh, I'm aware that uh, uh, we uh, passed five o'clock and uh, yeah, you have, you have the whole day ahead of you, so we don't want to take more of your time. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for, for your presentation and, and for, for the follow-up discussion. I think it's been fascinating and yeah, it's really interesting to see how translation is, is coming in, in our life and how we need to be aware of it. So, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll be able to continue this conversation. Exactly. That's exactly what I was going to say, venues. Constantine. Yeah. Hopefully it's not the end of the conversation, mm-hmm. but uh, that it will be continued. Thank you so much for the invitation. It was uh, really, really a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And 
as I said, hopefully we'll meet uh, face to face in a few months time. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And thank you very much to, to all the participants for being here and, yes. and uh, contributing to, to this discussion.